this is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics. Today's episode is about gerrymandering. In the first segment, I talk with Nicholas Stephanopoulos, who is a professor at the University of Chicago Law School. We had some audio and technical problems in recording this segment, and Nicholas graciously agreed to re-record part of the segment with me. So you will hear a distinct difference in audio between the first six or seven minutes and the rest of the segment. Just wanted to alert you to that in the beginning. Hi, everyone. This is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics, and I'm here with Nicholas Stephanopoulos. Hi, welcome. Hello, thanks for having me. Yes, thrilled to talk to you. So this episode is about gerrymandering, and so I wanted to talk to you some about the case that you're involved in right now, but also sort of a broader picture of gerrymandering and the efficiency gap. Can you give us just a little bit of background about how you became interested in gerrymandering and the kind of work that you do on it? So I guess I've been interested in redistricting ever since I was a law student. I took election law as a second or third year law student and I thought to myself that there's no practice that is more of an influence over the composition of the legislature and then the laws the legislature passes than redistricting. So, you know, if in a system of single member districts, how you draw those districts determines how votes are aggregated and ultimately what legislatures look like and what policies are enacted. And so I've always been interested in redistricting since law school. So as an academic here at the University of Chicago, uh, I wrote a number of papers on redistricting, focused on all sorts of issues. My work specifically on partisan gerrymandering really began when I read a draft paper by a political scientist named Eric McGee, who had come up with the, the concept of what's now called the efficiency gap. And uh, I read this draft paper before it was published, and I was really excited by it because I thought that in a field that had sort of been stuck in a rut, Eric could come up with a really novel, really powerful way to measure the severity of partisan gerrymandering. And so Eric and I teamed up and wrote a law review article that was based on his original political science article that tried to introduce the efficiency gap to a broader audience. And then from that article stemmed my involvement in uh, litigation as a lawyer too. And I guess the question of what is the efficiency gap? So it's a measure that tries to collapse into a single number all of the cracking and packing that is done in a district map. Cracking and packing are the two essential techniques that all partisan gerrymanders rely on. So cracking just means dispersing the other side's voters over a large number of districts where their preferred candidates lose you know, pretty predictably. And then packing means over-concentrating the other side's voters in a few districts where their preferred candidates win, but by uh, inefficient, overwhelming margins. And so the, the key insight that Eric had was that both cracking and packing produce wasted votes, uh, so votes that don't contribute directly to electing a candidate. With cracking, all of the votes that are cast for a losing candidate uh, are wasted. And with packing, all of the votes that are cast for the winning candidate over the 50% threshold that you need to win the district, those are all wasted. So the efficiency gap just uh, sums up each side's total wasted votes in an election, subtracts one total from the other, and divides by the number of votes cast. So it tells you in a single number which party is the the beneficiary or the victim of all of the cracking and packing choices that are in a district map. Yeah, so I'm thinking about, we've been going sort of a state-by-state look at politics, and so I'm thinking about examples that we've Mm -hmm. heard of both of the cracking and packing. And so cracking, the obvious example that comes to my mind is Austin, Texas which is split into something like nine different congressional districts now, but each of them is only a sliver of Austin, and then they extend far outside of Austin so that Democrats could probably get two congresspeople out of Austin, at least two or three, and instead have only one because of the way the district is cracked. And the example that comes to my mind for packing is Alabama, where there are seven congressional districts, And if Doug Jones had been running Congress races Mm -hmm, instead mm -hmm. of Senate, so he won the Senate seat, but he would have only taken one of those seven districts. So all of those votes are packed into that one, not all of them, but (laughs) a lot of them are packed into that one district. Yeah, I think Austin is an amazing example of cracking. 
So when you started to look at this efficiency gap, were you surprised at first to see what that gap looked like? So the idea is you're saying how, if you're trying to look at partisan gerrymandering, that you're saying how many votes are wasted by each side. Mm -hmm. Presumably there's always going to be some wasted votes. You're never going to have a completely purple map anywhere. But what does that look like in terms of what is a big sort of partisan divide and efficiency gap look like? What kind of gaps are we talking about? Yeah, we're talking so big congressional efficiency gaps are on the order of uh, 15, 20, maybe 25 percent. And that means that uh, so North Carolina, where there's something like a 20 percent efficiency gap, that might mean that if you look at all the wasted votes in North Carolina, maybe 60, 65 percent are wasted Democratic votes and 30, 35 percent are wasted Republican votes. Mm. What, what the efficiency gaps tell you also is what percent of extra seats a party is winning relative to a totally neutral map. So when you see a 20% efficiency gap someplace like North Carolina, that means Republicans are winning an extra 20% times 13 congressional districts. So an extra two and a half or three congressional seats relative to what a zero efficiency gap map would look like for North Carolina. When you started looking at the efficiency gap, what were the the trends that you were seeing and were efficiency gaps changing from what they used to be to the present? Yeah, so my my co-author and I calculated the efficiency gap for pretty much all congressional plans and all state legislative plans from 1972 to the present, which let us look at what, what trends we've seen. There were two main findings that apply for both Congress and state legislatures. One is that the absolute value, the the magnitude of the efficiency gaps that we've seen in the current redistricting cycle are the the biggest of the last half century. So the the extent, the, the sheer size of gerrymandering has spiked over the last few years to pretty much unprecedented levels. The other trend is that current efficiency gaps are more pro-Republican than at any other point over the last 50 years. And that's largely a function of Republicans being the ones in charge of redistricting in many of the country's swing states in the current cycle. That's because 2010 was a Republican wave election. And so it gave Republicans control over the the line drawing process in a whole bunch of states. And they really capitalized on that control and uh, achieved for themselves these remarkably large pro-Republican efficiency gaps. Are there also places in the country where there are large pro-Democrat efficiency gaps? Yeah, there are. And so to find those, you have to look for the places where Democrats were the ones in charge of redistricting in the current cycle. And uh, you had that happen in places like Maryland, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, to some degree, Illinois. And so it's absolutely not the case that Republicans are worse actors than Democrats when it comes to gerrymandering. It's just that Republicans had a lot more opportunity to gerrymander in the current cycle because they had a lot more control over the line drawing. But where Democrats had the authority, they were quite happy to to gerrymander to help themselves too. (laughs) Then let's talk about the Supreme Court cases that you've been involved with. Maybe we could start with the Wisconsin case, since that one is further along. And this is Gill versus Whitford. Yeah, so the, the Wisconsin case was argued in front of the Supreme Court in October. And so it's now uh, six months later, and we're we're waiting to see what the outcome of that case is going to be. The Wisconsin case is a challenge to the state house map in Wisconsin. So it's a state legislative, not a congressional lawsuit. And the lower court ruled in our favor back in 2016, which made it the first federal court to strike down a map on partisan gerrymandering grounds in more than 30 years. So it was a big deal that we were able to prevail in the lower court. The the Supreme Court seemed divided during its oral argument in October. A number of the liberal justices seemed quite sympathetic. A, a number of the conservatives called our approach sociological gobbledygook or <laughs> uh, or the equivalent of, of Justice Gorsuch's uh, steak rub, where he doesn't know the ingredients, but he knows it tastes good. And then Justice Kennedy was 
fairly quiet during oral argument, but he kept asking the Wisconsin lawyers whether a map would be constitutional if it explicitly said, you know, if the law that passed it explicitly said that it was trying to benefit one side and disadvantage another side. And so that suggested to me that Kennedy is concerned about overt partisan discrimination. And then presumably he's also concerned about the the functional equivalent of overt discrimination, where a law doesn't say that it's trying to help Republicans as much as possible. But we know from all sorts of other evidence that that's what the line drawers uh, were trying to do. Kennedy seems to find that to be a problem. And so that's, you know, at least modestly encouraging uh, commentary from him. And what does the Wisconsin State House look like? What does that map look like? What kind of efficiency gaps do you see there? Yeah, so that map has among the worst efficiency gaps that we've seen at the state legislative level in the last 50 years. So our our expert in the Wisconsin case calculated average efficiency gaps for every state house map from 1972 onward. Wisconsin has something like the fourth or fifth worst average efficiency gap of uh, any of these hundreds of maps. And the only maps that are worse are a handful of other maps currently in effect in places like um, North Carolina and, and Florida and Michigan. So, you know, not only was there clear intent to benefit Republicans in Wisconsin, they've succeeded in doing so to uh, an almost unprecedented extent. And you can see that if you look just at the numbers of representatives, right? There's something like 99 seats and I don't know the exact numbers, but an awful lot of them are held by Republicans in something that's traditionally been a bluish purple state. Yeah, exactly. So in in 2012, for example, Democrats won a majority of the statewide vote in Wisconsin, uh, something like 51 or 52 percent of the statewide vote. And yet Republicans won 60 out of 99 districts in the state house. In 2014 and 2016, Republicans won a tiny majority of the statewide vote, you know, 51 or 52 percent, and yet translated that into first 63. And now I think either 64 or 65 out of 99 seats. So these are are just enormous uh, uh, discrepancies. You know, it it shows you that this purple state, even this bluish purple state, has this uh, ruby red legislature, and it's all because of redistricting. And so then what is the North Carolina case about? The North Carolina case is virtually an analog to the Wisconsin case, except that it's being brought against a congressional map instead of a state house map. So the the target in that case is the the 13 seat North Carolina congressional delegation. And there too, Democrats won a majority of the statewide vote in 2012. Republicans won tiny majorities of the statewide vote in 2014 and 2016. And yet Republicans have been winning either nine or 10 out of 13 congressional seats in every election this cycle. And they've been doing it through textbook cracking and packing of Democratic voters. So our our trial in North Carolina took place in Greensboro, sort of medium-sized city. It easily could support one Democratic congressional district, but it is divided right down the middle. So half of Greensboro is uh, submerged in one Republican district, and the other half of Greensboro is submerged in another one. The city of Charlotte could easily support two congressional districts, but instead every Democrat anywhere in the vicinity is crammed into a single congressional district. So you, know, you, you almost can't get any more textbook cracking and packing than uh, what happened in North Carolina. And what is the status of that case right now? So there, too, we convinced the lower court to strike down the the statewide map. And so that became the second ever federal court case to strike down a partisan gerrymander. Uh, That happened in January of this year. The Supreme Court then stayed all further proceedings up until the court itself has had a chance to, to hear the case. 